Thank you all for bearing with us for just a few minutes. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, thank you all for taking time to be here, and thank you for those of you who are joining us online. We are live streaming this through uh, Facebook and through YouTube as well. Uh, so thank you all for taking time to be here tonight uh, or this afternoon. Uh, we're honored to have all of you here, uh, leaders uh, and, and some elected officials and, and representatives uh, from local, uh, state, and federal levels. And so we're really excited to have all of you here tonight uh, and, and coming together on, on what really is an amazing and special day. Uh, we're here to recognize the 35th annual World AIDS Day. It's been 42 years since the disease was first recognized and researchers began studying it. 39 years since Ryan White became infected. And it, this uh, next month will mark 20 years since President George W. Bush unveiled the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, codified uh, goal of ending the pandemic by 2030. You're going to hear more about that tonight. While science has made uh, great invest, uh, investments and great strides in both prevention and treatment, there still is no cure for HIV AIDS. An estimated 1.5 million people worldwide, 30,000 in America alone, are newly diagnosed with HIV each year. And more than half a million people die each year from AIDS-related illnesses across the globe. More than 18,000 here in the United States. And there are still uh, epidemic and pandemic proportions. Even though we're here in the Triangle, uh, in this region of North Carolina, home to Research Triangle Park, two of the nation's most prestigious medical universities, and ranked seventh and eighth for most educated communities in the United States, there is still an HIV AIDS epidemic crisis right here in our own backyard. 51% of HIV diagnosis in the United States occur in the southern region of the country, according to the CDC. AIDS view uh, prevalence map, which we have here, uh, show uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, that of the people living in the 27601 zip code, that's right here where we're at tonight, and then 27610 just down the street, that in those zip codes that there are, people are three to four times more likely to have a positive HIV diagnosis than the national average. They're three to four times more likely to have a positive diagnosis than the state of North Carolina's rate, and even three to four times more likely to have a positive diagnosis than the average rate for Wake County. Why? When you hear those numbers, we ask the question. I find myself asking that question, why? What is the difference here? What's the difference in downtown Raleigh and, and the southeast Raleigh district or areas? And what can we do about it? One of my first thoughts is maybe it's a financial thing, except for a few high-dollar uh, condo dwellers, a large number of people in those zip codes are facing financial hardships. We have moderate to low income rates, or maybe unable uh, to afford health insurance. However, when we look at what we're dealing with here in 2022, the cost to individuals for HIV prevention measures and anti- uh, or uh, antiretroviral therapy. It doesn't have to be a concern. Our finance doesn't have to be a concern. Furthermore, there has been a bipartisan effort to address the cost issues associated with this. Under President Barack Obama, the Affordable Care Act was passed that prevents insurance cancellation, eliminates the pre-existing condition exemptions, expands in-network uh, in providers to include Ryan White, HIV and AIDS program providers, and others. And it closes the Medicare D donut hole and expands Medicaid eligibility. In 2019, President Trump pledged to end the HIV epidemic in the United States by 2030 and reached an agreement with Gilead Sciences to donate PrEP uh, medication to 200,000 uninsured people each year until 2025. Now, under the Biden-Harris administration, the White House has published the National HIV AIDS Strategy, a federal implementation plan for 2022 through 2025. And it has four goals to prevent new infections, improve health outcomes, reduce disparities and in health inequities, and to achieve integrated, coordinated efforts across all partners 
and stakeholders. In September of this year, the United States Department or State Department released a reimagining of the Presidential Emergency Plan for AIDS a research strategic decision or st a strategic direction fulfilling America's promise to end the HIV AIDS pandemic by 2030 and it identifies 32 focus areas as a part of a five pillar strategic plan of health equity and priority population sustaining the response public health systems and security transformative partnerships and following science and as a side we have uh, all of those documents made available right there on the on the screen here and on the church's website. We've got a page dedicated for uh, those documents that you can find that information. Today, cost is not a valid reason for an, uh, any American to risk HIV exposure and not to use PrEP. Nor should cost be the reason for any American to not receive antiretroviral uh, therapy. If any uh, have positive diagnosis, there's no reason, no financial reason that they shouldn't have access to care. So what is going on in our backyard? In a word, I would submit fear. Fear of judgment, fear of persecution, fear of disenfranchisement by family, friends, and community. This is the most significant societal factor causing people to become infected and die from now, preventable and manageable. HIV infection. We, we, all of us, can solve the fear factor because we created the fear factor. We can, we can fix it because we created it. It comes from stigma. It comes from misinformation. It comes from disinformation. It comes from false narratives. And it comes from shaming by community members and leaders. It also comes from our refusal to have frank, open, public, real conversations about HIV and AIDS and the ways to prevent the transmission. Yes, we can make a difference. We have an authentic and honest responsibility to have public conversation about sex, about drugs, about diverse relationship, and about poverty economics. So that is why we have come together tonight. That's why we are all here tonight to start that public conversation right here in this community and begin to bring an end to the HIV AIDS pandemic right here in our own backyard. So tonight we're going to start the conversation and I'm going to introduce uh, Eugenia Rogers. I told you a, a story read earlier. So it's Eugenia Rogers, a community engagement co-chair uh, at Duke Center for AIDS Research. Eugenia's life has been affected by the HIV AIDS pandemic in countless ways. It has not only left an indelible mark on her life, but it also impacted her family, her friends, and her community. Her passion is to give a voice to those living in the shadow of HIV and to combat the stigma surrounding HIV and AIDS. She believes that when we take HIV's power, that we can defeat it. Eugenia is a witness to how the stigma surrounding HIV and AIDS can uh, divide communities, families, and relationships. Being labeled and ostracized herself, she knows firsthand what the pain of rejection feels like. Now she is focused on taking her past trials and sufferings and turning them into tools to inspire, to heal, and to motivate others. Please welcome Eugenia Rogers. Well, thank you, Pastor Vance, for that wonderful and beautiful introduction. Um, hello, everyone. It is such an honor to be here um, and to be able to speak about something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I just want to start off by talking about stigma a little bit because I can relate to that. I know what it's like. Stigma caused me to. Um, almost miss out on life and uh, fear, 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 being rejected, being ostracized, being, you know, just not welcome. But I thank God for my family, right? Because I have my cousin and my best friend. So I do have a support system now. I didn't always have that because um, 
I was afraid. I was afraid to talk. I was afraid. And that pushed me to a place, um, a very dark place, a place where I didn't want to take care of myself. And I almost exited this life. So I think it's important for me to talk about the seriousness of stigma um, because it wasn't until lately that I had enough power and confidence to say, I won't live in the shadows anymore. And I think it's important that we change the narrative, right? We have to be more embracing of people and talk more. We don't want to talk about sex. If you hear someone talk about HIV, they're going to whisper in somewhere in a corner. No, we need to talk about it. This is things. When I was diagnosed, and I'll just um, share this, there was no communication, absolutely nothing. I took my diagnosis, and I suffered silently. There wasn't even medication. So I've been down a long road, and I learned the hard way. Um, I experienced um, stigma. Uh, not only from people in the community that knew um, doctors in the beginning, because no one knew, no one knew. They didn't know anything, you know, and um, that was hard. And I think that was the, the where, where I began to, a portion of me died, right? So I did not reach out, I did not, I didn't have anybody and I didn't have anybody standing with me. I held on to that and I held that secret really, really tight until I got up the nerve to tell one person, and that was my brother. And so eventually over time, I began to share my story. But I really want to talk about this. Um, as a member of clergy myself, what I find a lot is that there aren't enough conversations in the places the conversation should happen, right? Because some will say, well, why would we want to have a conversation about sex or any of that in the church? Um, you have people's attention. And there's a lot of power in that. And we need to start the conversation over again and build better relationships, right, with members of clergy and being able to talk to um, their congregants, being able to do community events um, that will bring people in, making it a safe place to come in and to share. Um, because it's, you know, we, we see a lot of things now, but we do know that there are a lot of people that they're not talking. They're, some people just aren't even getting care. And the care is out there, right? Prep is out there, right? But I don't want to talk about it, you know. And I think if we open up a conversation in a different way in terms of just talking to people, just starting the conversation, talking to people, see how, see how they're doing, building relationships, that is so important. People have to have trust, right? And in a time where trust is really, really hard to come by, they need it. They need trust. And I think that was, that's one of the biggest hurdles. Stigma will cause people to suffer in silence. And I know that firsthand. Um, so again, I am so grateful for the opportunities to, to speak. And um, this, I'm just very passionate about um, people becoming more aware of what's out here, like PrEP. Um, and how we can prevent this disease from moving forward, how we can, you know, I would like for us to eradicate it by 2030. And I know we can, but it's going to be a team effort. It has to, and, and we just have to work hard at it. And those are my thoughts about it. So, um, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, um, Pastor Vance, for making this, available right for people to come in to get information people to come in to get healed right and people to come in to share their stories um and 
I thank you, and I, I pray that any, everybody here will take lesson and take something back from what's happening here today and, you know, build better relationships in their community. Thank you once again. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I will remind us, uh, before I introduce our next speaker, uh, the Alliance of Aid Services is uh, here in this space as well. Uh, we share space with them here, and they are providing testing services tonight. So if you don't know your status and would like to know that tonight, we encourage you to take time and uh, go and, and get tested. And their care team and care staff are here as well uh, to be able to provide support to anybody that's here that needs that. Our next speaker I'm going to in invite up. Uh, is Rita McDaniel. Rita has been the North Carolina AIDS Action Network's community organizer since 2018. Previously, Rita worked with the Triangle Empowerment Center as the women's facilitator and focused much of her work on HIV and its impact on women. In 2012, she founded the It's All About Me support group, which has helped minority women living with HIV throughout the Triangle region of North Carolina. She has served on the Duke AIDS Research and Treatment Community Advisory Board and was recognized uh, on the PAWS 100 list in 2017. Join me in welcoming Rita. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, between what um, the Pastor Van said, Eugenia spoke. I can get on the soapbox and talk all afternoon, but I won't permit it. Um, I'm going to tell y'all a story. Um, first of all, I want y'all to remember that I'm a mother, somebody's daughter, sister, not mine, um, and a grandmother. I'm the person that stands behind you in the grocery store at the fast food restaurant. Um, but I'm also a person living with HIV. So just for a minute, I want you all to imagine being in a old country store and you looking at all the stuff that's on the shelves. Um, I'm going to be a lonely jar of pickle. Um, and while I'm in the store, there are people walking by and they're looking and, you know, they're kind of walking around me. And I don't understand why. And they can't hear my cries. I'm crying out to them, saying, pick me up. Here I am. I'm over here. Somebody touch me. But they just keep walking by. But then something happens. Somebody stops. And they look at me. And they actually pick my jar up. But wait a minute, they're quiet and they're not saying anything. And I wonder what they're going to do then. Because on my label, it says in big bold letters, HIV. And I'm wondering, did they drop the shelf? Did they put me back on the shelf? What did you do? As I'm sitting there wondering in anticipation, they put me in their basket with their bread and their tomatoes and their eggs, and they take me home. I'm free. They're not afraid of me anymore. They're taking me home with all the other girls. And I feel like that I'm okay. Um, the reason that I wrote that was because excuse me. Um I married a man over twenty years ago who was living with HIV, he didn't tell me. And the stigma that we experience now is no different than what I experienced 29 years ago. Um, we need to learn to combat this stigma. We need to learn to talk about HIV. We need to learn to talk about sex. Um, I would love to be able to um, say, um, in a crowd of people, you know, I'm not feeling well today because I have HIV, but then I often wonder about the stigma and what the repercussions of that would be for me. Um, women are, 
have the highest rate of HIV in America today. Um, we have it a lot higher than our counterparts, um, women of color especially. Um, and it's so sad because there is so much information, there is so much medication out there that, um, that is open to us. But women are always last in research. Um, we're always the last to know about PrEP. If I hadn't been offered PrEP 31, 32 years ago, I probably would have taken it. But then again, I may not have. But at least I would have had the option that PrEP was out there to keep me from becoming HIV positive. Um, I have a great support team. My, my children are my paparazzi. Um, they go. They used to want to go with me everywhere, but they don't go with me anymore. Um, and my son just texted me, "Mom, this should be on um, on YouTube or Facebook or something." I didn't have time before you called me up to tell him it is, um, because you know you have to have someone that you can confide in in this journey, and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. But people in society has made it so that. We can't openly say what we're feeling, how we feel, um, to talk about the medications um, that are out there, the improvements that are out there. Um, my next goal in life, my journey is um, to get the HIV injectable. That's my next goal. Um, I feel like I'm the evolution of HIV because I've gone through so many stages of this. And I've gone from taking handfuls of medication to right now, I only take two medications a day. And it's only once a day, but before, I was taking like six, eight pills, two and three times, four times a day, at different times a day, and it was very hard for me to keep up with. Um, but now I'm so glad that the med medicine has evolved to where um, I'm able to take two pills a day. And pretty soon, I'll be um, taking the injection. And the nice part about that, I won't have to worry about pills, and I can take it once every other month, and I can feel safe. Um, and that's really a good thing um, now. Um, I wish more women, especially women of color, um, and not just, I, I feel like the, we have put people in a box within society because you only hear about um, sex workers or those of low income um, needing to be on PrEP or be exposed to PrEP. And we need to look at this as a universal disease. Um, it's actually a virus, but um, but it's not looked at that like that. Um, and so I just wish that everybody would, um, I work for North Carolina AIDS Action Network and we do policy and advocacy, and one thing that we do is we train our advocates to go up here in Raleigh once a year to speak to the legislators in a sense about what is important, and why medication is important, why Medicaid expansion is important. We also um, deal with things like hepatitis C, um, Medicaid expansion, um, women's rights. Um, so Girls AIDS Day is a very important day for me. Um, it's a day for me to look back that if you ask me, have I been cured, I'm going to tell you yes, because I've been here for 29 years. Um, whereas it, it, officially, I was only given six months to live with a CD4 count of two. Um, and I am here striving. Um, I'm doing my own thing now. It's kind of like the um, story, Stella got her groove back. I got my groove back. I'm loving life. And so I just thank you all for giving me this opportunity to speak, and please, please, please remember, um, we love to be hugged. I know with COVID and everything, but I'm a hugger. You know, <laughs> hug someone today, um, because a lot of people are so ashamed to be in hug, they don't think they can be loved. I have friends that um, won't have a sex life, excuse me, I don't mean no, no harm. <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect, but you know, a lot of my older friends who are HIV positive feel like they can't have a sex life. And you can't, especially if your CD4 is undetectable for six months. Um, you don't have to use condoms, but you know, we still encourage people to use condoms to keep from contracting other um, STIs. 
but you know, um, life is good now. You know, I tell anybody, um, I don't know why this happened to me, but I thank God that I did because I've learned so much. I've learned, I've met so many wonderful people. And like I said, World AIDS Day is like my favorite time of the year because I re reminisce and I see progress that um, medication has made <laughs> and knowing that, hey, I got another year here. And so I thank you all. Thank you so much, and, and you do not have to apologize. That's why we're here tonight. We need to talk about <laughs> sex. I think there was a little song that they used to play that, that would sing along and say we talk about sex. We can't play that because we're live streaming and we don't have copyright license to do that. But otherwise, we'd probably be playing that tonight, too. Next, I'd like to introduce the Reverend Jimmy Leon Gibbs. Uh, in addition to being an ordained minister uh, in the United Church of Christ, an on-call chaplain with multiple uh, Wake Med campuses, Jimmy was elected chair of the National Center for AIDS Research uh, Community Advisory Board in 2021. He also serves as the UNC Community Collaborative Board for the UNC Center for AIDS Research in Chapel Hill, the Duke, uh, Duke HIV Research and Treatment Community Advisory Board, and is the vice president of the Affordable Community Residence Association Board, which provides housing and supportive services for people living with disabilities and with HIV. Please welcome my dear friend, the Reverend Jimmy Gibbs. Thank you, Pastor Vance, and thank you, Eugenia and Rita, for sharing your stories. I've known you all so long, and the journeys are so inspirational to me personally. A full decade after World War II, Raleigh's white and black development community leaders got together and they decided to create four housing developments in Southeast Raleigh. One of them, Rochester Heights, Biltmore Hills, Battery Heights, Madonna Acres. Why is this important? Well, at that time, you're looking at people that needed new places to go. It was after the war, people started making a little bit more money but what was holding people back was a nice, decent place to call home. So what happened was one black man, uh, I think we'd all know who he is, Mr. Leitner, his dad, owned a lot of land in Southeast Raleigh. But even he could not find a developer to work with him in a bank to bring his dream to fruition. So what happened? He partnered with a white individual, this white man, and he sold the land into lots. And 135 homes ended up in this area, Southeast Raleigh. Why is that important? I'm a child of that neighborhood. I was born in Biltmore Hills in 1962. We grew up there. Our families had had, many of our families, had this was their first home. They had come out of the housing projects in the surrounding area. They had gotten decent jobs. My dad was a truck driver. My mother worked for two college presidents at a university right down the street. And so we were middle class people. We thought we were living the dream, and we were. We played outside until the street lights came on. That was our sign to go inside as in most African-American neighborhoods. So why have things changed today? I didn't know I was a gay black minister in the 60s. I didn't know in the 70s. I really didn't know in the 80s. But I knew something was different in the neighborhood that I grew up in. We felt safe. We felt loved. Everybody was your mama. And I tell you, thank God I was a good one because I'd have been burning today. But let me tell you, fast forward into the 80s. Here comes the AIDS epidemic. Sad but true, my best friend contracted HIV. We called it something else then, GRID, some other things that went along with that. But we just didn't know what it was. Just like today, we didn't know what COVID was, did we? We didn't know how to get it. We just knew that you could get it. 
So what happened was, Elijah and I, he contracted it, but I didn't. I don't know why. We traveled in the same circles. Elijah used to ask me, why didn't you get it? Because we were best friends. We hung out together. We had the same friends. I told Elijah one night when I was caring for him, his mom worked night shift. I was sitting there rubbing the sweat off of his brow. And I said, you know, Elijah, imagine us being at Pullen Park on a merry-go-round. And every time the merry-go-round stopped, you got off. But I didn't. That just saved me. But did it save him to know that I was safe and he wasn't? Because what happens to one of us happens to all of us. That's why we all joined together in his neighborhood and helped his mother care for him so she could work a full-time job at night at Wake Med. That's what families do. Because when something happens to one of us, it affects eventually all of us. Who would have thought this little tiny bedroom community in Southeast Raleigh has the highest prevalence of HIV? It's not even two miles from here. You could walk all the way down to the end of this street, Blunt Street, and make a right, make a left, and make a right, and you'll be right there in our neighborhood, not even two miles from here. It's a desirable neighborhood now. People brought their, bought their homes for $7,000, seven to 10 grand. Got you a three bedroom, one bath house in 1960. I had an offer the other day for $300,000 for that same three bedroom, two, one bath house, not even two bathrooms. So what does this really mean? I chair the National CFAR Cab Coalition. Let me explain what that is. All of these institutions that do research in the United States receive funding from the NIH. We're talking about Duke, UNC, others out there across the country, Seattle, UW, UCLA. All of those schools get HIV funding through the NIH to do research, to develop new strategies, new medications, clinical trial research. And it brings that back to us. And what did Rita just say? She's down from 36 pills when I remember it, Rita, down to 16 pills when I remember it, Rita, and Rita's down to two a day. That's because of the research. That's because of research that is being done locally, UNC and Duke, right here, under our nose, and it's gonna make life better for all of us. Because when, when Rita's healed, we all feel her healing spirit. We all captured that emotion and that spirit of Rita today, and Eugenia, one town over. Same spirit. This isn't a sad, sad party. This is an informational party for you to understand that people live, thrive, and survive with HIV. We are not put in a box by what we have. We're put in a box so that we can be a gift to all of you. We're gifts to all of you. Because we want you to understand that, yes, we are stigmatized. Yes, you don't understand. It's because of lack of education. You have not gone out to the internet and looked for what you should be looking for. You look for everything else, recipes and all of that stuff. But when it comes down to what's happening right up under your nose, 27610, you don't know. But today is your day to learn. Today is your day that we'll educate you. We'll spend time with you. We'll commune with you. That's what ministers do, commune with you. But I want you to listen to this story and I, as I end. In ancient times, a king had his men place a boulder on a roadway. He then hid in the bushes and watched to see if anyone would move the boulder out of the way. Some of the king's wealthiest merchants and courtiers passed by and simply walked by the rock. Many people blamed the king for not keeping the roads clear. But none of them did say anything about getting the stone removed. But one day, guess what? One of us came along, carrying some vegetables, as Rita said, and approached the boulder, and a farmer laid down his load, and he tried to push the stone out of the way. After much pushing and straining, 
he finally managed. After the farmer went back to pick up his vegetables, he noticed a purse lying in the road where the boulder had been. The purse contained many coins, gold coins, and a note from the king that explained that the gold was for the person who removed the boulder from the road. Today, we have the purse. It's filled with resources, as Rita said, to tackle all of our problems today. On this podium with me are activists, scientists, community engagement specialists, and health professionals ready to train, educate, and encourage, and inspire us to live our dream. Today, these purses are filled with knowledge to fight those that stand against us and try to separate us from knowing all we can do to work together in peace and harmony. Today is your day. Listen, act, react, and let's work together to make our community a better place, a more informed and better community. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for being here and all the work that you continue to do. I now have the honor and privilege of introducing to you Dr. Felicia Brown, a senior research uh, social uh, epidemiologist in RTI Substance Abuse, Gender, and Applied Research Program. Uh, the team of researchers at RTI have been working locally and globally since the early 1990s on community-based interventions to ad address HIV. These projects have developed from behavioral and biobehavioral outcomes to end HIV. Dr. Brown is also an adjunct faculty at uh, Uni uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Gillings School of Global and Public uh, and Core Assistant Director of the Social and Behavioral Research Corps at the UNC Center for AIDS Research. Please welcome Dr. Brown. Thank you. It's an honor to be here and it's an honor to be on the panel with everyone. Um, I just want to share some reflections. Um, I have not been working in the field since the early 1990s. I, I know our team has been, um, and that is in the bio, uh, of course. Um, but I just want to be uh, clear that I've been doing this work for the last 15 years, which it's been a privilege. Um, I'm from Durham, and so I do work in Durham and Raleigh, and I do work in South Africa. And it's a privilege to be able to do work in my own community um, and part of it was when I was a kid growing up and seeing certain disparities and feeling like you couldn't um, have an impact or you know you didn't see things changing and, and wanting to make that change and so um, being able to actually have an impact um, through community-based interventions has been really exciting for me so I think um, I just wanted to share a few reflections so um, Yes, we have made some advancements in the field in terms of the work we've done. So a lot of the work we've done in the past has been behavioral interventions, right? So a lot of focus on education, skills building, um, knowledge, which is all really important. But now with the advancements with PrEP, um, with art, and you know things that can have, I'm sorry, so that we can combine both behavioral and biobehavioral, um, we're able to have a greater and sustained impact. So a lot of the work we're doing now is really harnessing those two types of interventions to have that sustained impact. Um, we also are doing a lot of work um, to address things like stigma and discrimination, sort of those isms that have come up already, right? Um, because it's not just enough to work with individuals and with partners and with communities. We have to really address stigma and the structural, um, um, structural stigma as well as um, stigma that happens at all these different levels and even individual level stigma and perceived stigma that happens because of um, continued sort of treatment and discrimination. And so I was sort of thinking about the theme of uh, this World AIDS, or World AIDS HIV Day. Um, I call it World HIV Day because I'm trying to sort of change terminology a little bit, but um, part of it is, it says, putting ourselves to the test, achieving equity to end HIV, right? Um, so, Part of it is putting, you know, putting ourselves to the test and challenging ourselves. Um, but the other part is, what does equity mean? And so I was sort of reflecting on lessons learned in the work that we've done over the years and how does that relate to equity? And so there's sort of three um, lessons that I think we've learned over the years is 
One that we really got to address social determinants. Um, so social determinants such as the places that we live, where we work, where we play, um, you know, like our neighborhoods, our education, our employment. Um, so yes, we want to address HIV, but it's not just about HIV. It's what happens before HIV. It's about incarceration. It's about employment. It's about what happens when somebody is born, right? So it's through the whole life. And so um, we have been really trying to be more intentional about even if we're not having an intervention that actually addresses that, that we're still keeping that in the forefront of what we're doing. Um, and so in some of our work here in North Carolina, we've actually found that for young women um, who experience food insecurity, they have two times the um, odds of having an SDI compared to people who do not have food insecurity. And so um, we do have an intervention that we have developed um, over the years that has addressed HIV risk reduction, as well as addressed some of those social determinants such as um, housing and employment. So we're sort of coming back to sort of where we started with a lot of our work in that respect. And then also as part of that, I just want to mention too, with COVID, right, we know that some of those disparities have really been exacerbated. And unfortunately, we see those disparities in black and brown communities as well. So it's just really sort of widening those um, disparities and those gaps. It's really um, essential that we really keep those in mind in the work that we do. I think the second lesson is just the importance of inclusion and collaboration. And so thinking about um, you know, who's um, included and who's excluded, or rather like who's at the table and who's not there in the work we do. And so um, in, you know, I'm a researcher, but I'm very clear that it's not about me. Um, there, it's a team approach. Um, and so um, luckily St. John um, MCC has been really, um, they've been a collaborator and a partner in the work that we've done in our community boards. Um, we've also had um, a lot of stakeholders, service providers, um, other researchers. And so we can't, like, we can't do this work in isolation um, because, in fact, if we really are going to end the epidemic, um, we need each other to ask better questions and to be more innovative in the work that we do. So, for example, we are doing a lot of mobile health technology using app-based approaches with young people, which has been really exciting. Um, and so we need young people who can tell us, that's not going to work, or, you know, you could do that a little bit better. And so that makes us better, and that's going to be a way that we end um, the epidemic. And then I would say just the third thing that has come up already, so I don't necessarily need to spend so much time on this, but just this idea of stigma. Um, I can't say it enough, and it really broke my heart to hear that stigma hasn't changed over the years. Um, because I think stigma happens in so many ways, and we don't even realize it sometimes. It's, um, it's the unsaid things, it's the said things, it's a little like the words, right? When somebody hears infected, when somebody hears you know, clean or things like that, like what does that really mean and what are you saying to somebody? And so um, I would just encourage us all um, in sort of thinking about the team, right? Putting ourselves to the test, like what is, like how can we be better? And so, um, and I say that as a researcher because I read things sometimes and even things that we have sort of published over the years where we say like sex worker, mm, that's not really person first language, people who conduct sex work, right? So I think we can always be better and we can always reflect on sort of our, our work and sort of pushing things forward a bit. But, um, and then just one other thing related to that is that it's not only about HIV, but it's also about other intersecting identities. And so I think we need to be really, um, we need to be really careful about affirming and supporting communities, marginalized communities. Um, and thinking about from a, like from the community, um, uh, from like, you know, from a patient perspective, from a research participant perspective, because how somebody feels determines whether they engage in services, whether they want to participate in a study, whether they want to tell you that they're living with HIV, and all of those things impact their lives. So um, I think we just need to all really reflect on um, how we can be better. And then I think I will end there, but just I think to echo what everyone else has already said, uh, we need we need everyone. I mean, I think we all play a part in getting to end HIV. And so um, there's something, no matter how little it is, whether it's just thinking about the language you use, getting tested if you don't know your status, there's something that you can do 
so that we can move forward. And I will leave it there, but thank you. Thank you so much. This forum wouldn't be complete if we didn't hear about what is happening locally too in the pandemic. So it is now my honor and privilege to introduce to you Jacqueline Clymore, the HIV STD hepatitis director in the Communicable Diseases Branch of the North Carolina, Health, uh, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Jacqueline oversees the programmatic work of HIV care under Ryan White, housing under HOPA, uh, HIV and STD prevention, the uh, AIDS Drug Assistance Program, and the HIV Health Equity Program. Prior to joining the Division of Public Health, she worked for 20 years in various positions with the Triangles Alliance of AIDS Services Carolinas, including serving as former executive director of that organization. So I introduce to you now Jacqueline Kleinmore. It really is an honor to be here with all of these people, with Jimmy, who I've known for ages, Felicia, who I've known for not quite ages, but a while, with Felicia and with Rita, who I've also known for ages. And I appreciate Reverend Vance the, the invitation to be here. I always approach World AIDS Day not quite sure what I want to say. Do, do I want to talk about how many years have passed? The first person I knew in 1982 who died of HIV in three weeks? Do I want to talk about the hospice work that I did, opening a hospice and spending time with dozens and dozens of people at the end of their life who are still with me every single day? I think about them all the time. I have pictures of them. I think about what they would think about where we are now, how far we've come, what we're doing, but what we're not doing. What would they think? They, they're, they're always kind of voices in the back of my head. I approach this day with deep sadness, always. I always will. But also with a lot of joy and with a lot of hope. There's lost clients, there's lost friends, there's lost colleagues, and people who are, were and are very dear to me. But there's also so much more joy now than we had back in 1990, because now we expect people to live long and happy, successful lives. That is my expectation about HIV now. I couldn't always say that. This has been my professional work always, and, and I say that with great uh, humility. I've been very lucky to do what I do. And I think part of the reason I first got into it was because I wanted to hug, as Rita said, the importance of hugging people when they weren't getting very many hugs. Um, I could talk about the numbers. As the Reverend said, I'm from the state. I got lots of numbers. <laughs> There are 35,632 people who are living with HIV in North Carolina right this minute. That's a lot of people. It's not as big as the entire 10 million in the state, but when people who are living with HIV wonder whether or not they are alone in this, there are 35,631 other people living with HIV just in this state. And I think that's important to know. 67% of those people are virally suppressed. That's the holy grail of HIV these days. If you're going to live with HIV, you want to be virally suppressed by taking your medicine. And what Rita said was so true when I worked in hospice, mountains of pills. I don't know how we ever kept track of the piles of pills that we were supposed to give people. And now it's one or two a day, truly. Injectables are almost here. That in itself, is a joyous miracle for people living with HIV now. And with viral suppression, you live well, you live healthy, and you also don't have to tell your sexual partners that you are, in fact, HIV positive if you've been virally suppressed for at least six months. Rita mentioned that. That was a huge change in North Carolina law in 2017, 2018. That was a big deal, and that was very much about reducing stigma using science and fact to address how we address HIV. Not about how we feel, but about what the science tells us. And the science tells us that if you're virally suppressed and you stay that way, and you follow your doctor's 
recommendations, you don't need to tell people about your HIV if you don't want to, because you can't give it to them. That's joyous news. We have PrEP, that pill. Take it once a day, and you won't get HIV, like birth control pills. It's that simple. But stigma stops a lot of people from being willing to get on PrEP. They're afraid to tell their doctor that they might need PrEP. What does that mean? It means they're afraid to tell their doctor that they're sexually active. We're pretty hardwired for that, you know? <laughs> that, that, that's kind of what human beings do. That's how we get more human beings, among other things. So talking about sex, as all of my predecessors have so eloquently said, is really, really important. First of all, we're sexual beings. That's how we were made. But secondly, if we don't talk about it, we harm ourselves. We harm our families. We harm the people around us. We harm our children. I'm the mother of four people. Four not little people anymore. Four people. <laughs> and those people who are not little um, needed to know that message. All of the little people out there still need to know that message as they grow up, that sex is a normal thing, but you have to take certain precautions. You have to be responsible. You don't want to get pregnant when you don't want to get pregnant, and you don't want to end up with any illnesses that you might have to deal with especially if they might be long-term. We've heard a lot about disparity, and that is so very true. The number of people of color who are disproportionately affected by HIV is vast, and it does come down to things like Felicia just talked about, social determinants of health, housing. It comes down to education. It comes down to whether you have access to health care. North Carolina is one of 12 states that has still not expanded Medicaid. We need to do that. Because if you don't have access to health care, any time you need it, not just if you break your leg and go to the emergency room, but any time you need it, then you will not get the preventive, not to mention the treatment care that you need with HIV or anything else. We need to teach about STDs. We had a significant rise in STDs, especially syphilis and congenital syphilis, babies born with syphilis. This has been one of the serious effects of the COVID pandemic in recent years, a huge rise in STDs. That affects HIV as well. If you have been exposed to an STD, you are more likely to be exposed to HIV. Those are just facts. So we need to keep talking about what all of that means. We need to be aware that viral suppression does not reach everybody equally. It truly does not. Hispanic and Latinx men who report sex with women are one of the largest groups now who are not achieving good health care outcomes, meaning they are not achieving viral suppression. That same group, Hispanic and Latinx men, American Indian women, are continuing to struggle to get the pills that they need to live well with HIV. Um, we know that people who inject drugs, people who use drugs, are often marginalized in all kinds of ways, stigma on top of stigma on top of stigma. And so they don't even seek treatment until it's too late, until they're very ill. So we have a lot going on. 83% of people in North Carolina are estimated to have their HIV medical needs met last year in 2021, which is really great. 85% is a great number. That means 15% didn't, though. So we've got 15% of people who still need medical care. They're not getting what they need to live well with HIV. And then there's stigma, and that's been talked about. I brought along copies tonight of the state's plan to end HIV. And in that, one of the first things I wrote was, if we could end HIV stigma, we could end HIV. I absolutely believe that with my heart and soul. If people didn't have to worry about telling someone for years and years that they have HIV, they would do well. They would do better. People with cancer generally don't have to worry about that. They get the support of their community and their family, their pastors, their neighbors bring over casseroles. They ask, how are you doing, and what's going on, and did you get your medicine, and can I take you to the doctor? People living with HIV generally don't get that, and we need to be doing that. That's stigma, my friends. That's how stigma works, and that's why we have to keep fighting against it. Because without it, we can't get people where they need to be to live well with HIV, every single person. And we can't stop HIV. We can't stop other people from acquiring HIV. So 
I do have a lot more joy than I did in 1990 around World AIDS Day because now we do expect people to live longer. We expect to be able to prevent HIV with PEP and with PrEP. I expect people to get their medicine, to become virally suppressed, and to live into old age. Old age. I expect people who are living with HIV to be 80 and 90 years old. We're yeah. getting there. The people in this room who are living with HIV will live to be 80 and 90. It doesn't change the fact that there are an awful lot of disparities. There's an awful lot of barriers. But we do persist because we believe in hope and believe, because we believe that we can realistically expect to overcome HIV in our lifetimes. So thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you all for being here, for sharing your stories, for, for talking with us. Uh, what a, a powerful statement that if we end stigma, we end HIV. If we end stigma, we end HIV. What a powerful notion. And to understand, as we talked about earlier, we have the power to do that. We have the power to do that, to end it right now, to start that work right now. And to hear, as, as Rita shared with us earlier, that the stigma faced, I think it was Rita or Eugenio shared with us, that the stigma faced in the 80s is no different today. That we haven't made any progress there. That's where the work needs to take place. As is our tradition here at St. John's and MCCs around the world, we never want to leave a conversation without giving us some very clear actions that we can take. And I think that the, the speakers and the folks that have shared with you tonight have done a great job of lay, lay, laying out the actions that we need to take. First, I would say that we need to know our status, regardless of whether we think we're at risk or not. Uh, no matter what we think our risk factor is, know your status. There are ways that you can get tested. There's testing that's happening here tonight. There's testing happening here in this building every single day. If you're not in this area, look to find where you can get tested at. Look to your local health departments, they, and, and they'll show you where you can go get tested at. If you don't know, call us. We'll help you find it. I don't want anybody to not be able to find where you can get tested at. Know your status. Secondly, end stigma. Start talking about it. We're afraid. You heard one of the speakers tonight and, and apologized, looked at me because they're in a church and looking at a person in a clergy collar that said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean talk about sex. <laughs> we need to talk about it. We've, we've not talked about it in the one place we should have been safe to have done that. Talk about it. Let's end the stigma. You heard Jacqueline just share with us that if we end stigma, we end HIV. Talk about it. Talk about it with your friends your family, your co-workers, talk about it. That is how we win, how we get rid of this stigma. Third uh, action that we can take uh, is if you test negative, start taking PrEP. Consider start taking PrEP. If you don't know what that is or don't know anything about it or want to know more about it, there's ways that you can find that out. There's folks right here tonight that will talk with you about it. If you're joining us online, send a message and we'll get you connected to somebody. In your conversations, talk about it. Get started on PrEP. If you test positive, there's care, there's, there's medicines now that you can take to bring your viral loads down into, as we just heard, live into your 80s and 90s. The cheeseburger would take me out before <laughs> HIV. <laughs> take action and know your status. Start PrEP, consider starting it, talk with your uh, health care professionals or talk with someone uh, here at the Alliance or other organizations about it. And lastly, for our elected officials, for those who may be gathered here, those that are joining us online and those that have requested copies of this video, uh, we, we encourage you to continue the good work that has started, but we also encourage you to call yourselves and your colleagues to task. Expand funding for research, testing, and, and treatment, and for care services, such as housing and food allowances. Expand those programs. Vote to improve laws and policies that educate and help reduce transmission, such as sex ed in schools, legal access to condoms by minors, and open access for syringe purchases and needle exchange programs. 
We also need to keep our eyes wide open for any attempts to attack the protections provided or afforded to people living with HIV and AIDS from discrimination and access to health care or to remove HIV AIDS as a recognized disability together as they've already shared with you tonight together we can bring these numbers down together we can bring an end to HIV together we can do this but as they said early on and you heard over and over again it's a community effort it's going to take all of us it's going to take all of us in this room and it's going to take our elected officials we're calling you to task it's time that we can this is preventable this is manageable this is something we know what to do we know how to handle it we can take care of it and particularly right here we're sitting in the middle of the, these two zip codes that have these rates that three to four times what our, our local and state averages are and I three to four times even what the national averages are we can bring these numbers down we can ensure that those with a positive diagnosis have a high standard of living free from stigma free from bullying and free from discrimination we must not we can we must do our part in putting an end to the epidemic to this pandemic we must leave this place wherever you're joining us from online or here we must leave this place knowing there is action that we have to take and that we can bring it in thank you for your time thank you all for all the speakers for being here some of them are, uh, have other engagements and may have to leave but others will be able to stay behind and talk with you if you're interested in talking more and learning more and again the Alliance of Aid Services is here to uh, uh, provide care and support and just answer any questions you may have and I just noticed that the executive director for the LGBT Center is here with us tonight as well and uh, they're available to, to uh, talk with you as well so thank you all for being here thank you for your time God bless you and let's take action and do something amen